Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. <laughs> Firing off that last text before I turn my phone off for the next three hours. Do not disturb. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, watching my boxes populate, we'll allow a few minutes here as we're getting everyone online and waiting for quorum. Excellent. I think we need Mr. Marks to complete our quorum. Christina will not be joining us, unfortunately, today. She had a flight cancellation and was rerouted and is, I think, in the air right now. So, so is the way of the world. Ah, okay. I see we have our quorum. And so at 12.03 on July 6, 2022, I would like to call the meeting of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust and uh, get started with our agenda. 
I'm Laura Anderson. I'm the chair of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. And if I could call on our board members to introduce themselves um, and uh, in no particular order, we're a small enough group, I think we can <laughs> jump on in. I'll go ahead first. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Steve Marks I'm here in Portland, Oregon, and I am a board member on the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. Thanks, everybody, for the meeting today. Hi, Christine Moffat, down in beautiful Coos Bay, um, and also a member of the Oregon uh, Trust. Well, hi, everybody. David Gomberg, state representative on the Central Coast, House District 10. I'm a non-voting member of the trust. And good afternoon, Dick Anderson, state senator, District 5, um, here on the Oregon coast, and also a uh, non-voting member of the trust. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, for joining us, Representative Gomberg, Senator Anderson, and our other members. Christina Wolkonikoski will not be joining us today, but we will have a voting forum with three voting members present. We also do have a vacant seat that we will be uh, recommending uh, filling um, as our first agenda item today. Before I get to that, this is the time when we would normally approve the meeting summary from the previous April meeting. We don't have that available for approval today. We've had uh, some new people join the department and just need a little bit more time to prepare the meeting summary from April. So we will approve that in October along with the workshop uh, meeting minutes that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. So moving forward from there, we have a really great agenda today. I'm excited to hear some updates on projects that we have in the works and also make some decisions on guidelines for projects that we are putting into the works. So it's a pretty full boat. Um, I would like just to clarify on the agenda that as the board deliberates the RFP concept approval for the near shore, we will hear public comment before we vote to move forward with an approval of guidelines. So individuals will have an opportunity to comment and the board can consider those comments before we approve the guidelines. Uh, and uh, Lisa DeBrookier will be guiding us through that process today. We may start public comment a little bit earlier than 240, but we will also retain the 240 time um, if we're running ahead of schedule, but we also want to make sure if people are jumping on at that time, that that time is available for them. So great. Well, I would love to get started with our agenda and introduce um, an applicant for our vacant board seat. We all, uh, the board members had an opportunity to to interact with Dr. Karina Nielsen in our workshop. Dr. Nielsen is the newly hired director of Oregon Sea Grant, replacing uh, Shelby Walker in that position, who was our former OOST board member. So it was with great enthusiasm that I met with Dr. Nielsen and bring her forward as a candidate for our vacant seat. Um, her CV and letter of interest was included with the meeting materials. I can't even begin to dissect her background. 
<laughs> and all of the experience and knowledge that she can bring to this organization. I just want to take just a couple of minutes to maybe give a little bit of background uh, that is not always included on an individual's CV. And I think one of the reasons why Dr. Nielsen was such a strong candidate for the Oregon Sea Grant position is really that she has taken such an untraditional path to get to where she is today, um, coming from New York City and uh, going um, through college in kind of a circuitous way, as many of us do. As a restaurateur myself, I was very impressed that she worked through the restaurant uh, industry uh, in many different ways, putting herself through college, starting a family, and returning to school as a working mother. Um, her big move to the West Coast, uh, coming out here to Oregon State University to complete her PhD and um, and do her postdoc research in Chile is um, also just probably one of the big pivot points in her life. Um, I am really glad that she decided to come back to Oregon after working um, and teaching at Sonoma State University and San Francisco State University. We're very lucky to have her here at OSU and with Sea Grant. I really see this as a win for Oregon and hopefully for the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. She has experience working with the California Ocean Science Trust and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Nielsen, but it still sits on the board of that organization and with the California Ocean Protection Council. So those are just a few things that may not have popped up in a traditional CV. And with that, I'd like to ask Dr. Nielsen just to speak to us a little bit more about um, herself and her interest in this position. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Laura, and um, uh, appreciate you bringing in some of my non-traditional background too, because I have found that actually it's very, very relevant. Just um, one uh, small correction. I, I have stepped down from the ocean, the California's Ocean Protection Council Science Advisory Team. I'm trying to focus my efforts here in Oregon as part of my new role. Um, I am retaining the uh, board seat for now on the uh, California Ocean Science Trust. Um, so just, just for clarity on that. Um, I, uh, I, I think the other, the other thing that I would like to highlight that maybe isn't already in my CV or what Laura communicated with you is that, that a, a really strong emphasis in my career um, and an opportunity afforded to me by being part of the California State University system was the emphasis on community engagement and engagement and service work. I took that to heart and it was something that I always wanted to do is to work with, um, with folks in the community and, and bringing science into um, uh, to, to agencies and to management and to just policy. Um, and I was able to do that um, by participating a lot in, in uh, science advising uh, at the state level in California and, and participating in stakeholder engaged processes around conservation management stewardship uh, type work. So I feel well prepared uh, to contribute here in Oregon. I'm excited to be back. Uh, I, I really was charmed by moving to Oregon and working on the Oregon coast, fell in love with it through my graduate work um, and have always actually kind of been aching for a way to come back. So for me, this is a bit of a, of a, um, a dream come true to be back here and to be able to, to continue working um, with our coastal communities and, and with the state and bringing, helping to translate and bring good science uh, uh, to help inform our decision-making going forward. So, um, Thank you for the invitation to apply, and um, um, I'd be I'd be honored to serve. Thank you very much. Uh, would and, uh, any of the board like to address any questions or comments to Karina at this time? Well, I'll just speak up as a member of the Sea Grant Advisory Board. Um, we already had one meeting with Karina. It was very interactive, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, lots of engagement uh, with you and in your new ideas and, uh, and 
I really uh, think the emphasis on communication, as we discussed it, even in the C grant meeting, and the importance of of really understanding messaging and so forth. And certainly, this group is also look, looking seriously at how how we do that and how how to be accurate in in the message, but also uh, be clear enough so that it it uh, sinks in and and is is something that can be digested uh, within people that don't have the science backgrounds that we have. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank, and thank you, uh, Dr. Moffitt. Um, I wanna echo that. I, uh, I think this is a great fit. I think that um, the charge of the Oregon Ocean Science Trust aligns well with the mission behind uh, Oregon Sea Grant broadly and the Sea Grant program um, as well, um, and I and so I'm I'm excited about this and and offer my support for um, for Dr. Nielsen to 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 join the the, the trust. Um, I don't have any questions specifically. I did uh, thank you for the letter of interest and for the uh, long. Um, the CV, very impressive CV with lists of accomplishments and uh, peer reviewed journals, uh, several of which I had read before and I'm and, and very grateful to, to have that information. I guess um, the one thing I would, one question, if I did have a question, it would be uh, Dr. Nielsen to um, maybe get a, a, a bit of a sense about your vision for uh, the, or what you like, where you see Oregon Sea Grant going and, maybe what some of the opportunities are between the funding um, that the Oregon Ocean Science Trust has been able to secure and uh, for nearshore research and marine research and how that can leverage work that Oregon Sea Grant is doing um, and where, where there's overlap in priorities um, and where we can fill uh, science uh, data uh, needs that, uh, that help us fulfill you know, the vision for what the trust is up to and, and what Sea Grant would like to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So even just a few ideas on where some of those overlaps are, what some of the opportunities are for leveraging um, each other's work. Yeah, well, I'm very interested in, in, in finding those leverage points and understanding them better. I would say that I'm, I'm just at my one month anniversary in the role and have been, as, uh, as many of you will know, drinking out of the proverbial fire hose of information. Uh, Oregon Sea Grant has a very broad mission um, and uh, both in, in research and education and engagement. Um, we have uh, a lot of work with extension in the community. And so one of the things that's happening right now is we're involved in our four year cycle of strategic planning. Um, uh, as as uh, uh, Christine just mentioned, we advisory councils involved with that. So we're scoping that out right now um, and hope to have uh, a clearer um, uh, opportunity to, to share with stakeholders uh, that draft plan and get some feedback on it. I think we all know that, you know, there, there are various things that have already come to my attention and on the plate, you know, there's potential connectivity. Um, there's going to be um, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. White in a, in a bit at this meeting on the Marine Reserves report. Uh, I don't know what that says yet, but, uh, you know, the, the Science and Technical Advisory um, Committee from OPAC is going to be receiving that. There's the, the RFP that this group is working on now for the nearshore uh, science needs. Uh, there seems like there's probably some overlap and um, connectivity there with some of the areas that, that Oregon Sea Grant is already involved in funding through our, our research uh, funding. We also bring, uh, you know, we're, we're able to help connect with NOAA and other federal resources. Um, it's something that's on the minds of lots of folks right now is the um, impacts and, and the way in which um, offshore wind may be coming in uh, to uh, our communities. And uh, there's a lot of, of things we need to understand more about. So I'm trying to get a handle on that, as many of you are, to understand how Oregon Sea Grant can help facilitate, bring resources, help understand, uh, and contribute to, to those, um, those efforts at the state level as well. Um, I would say those are, those are some of the areas that are just sort of popping uh, in from stakeholders and, and uh, conversation points. We're also very involved in the disaster preparedness effort with uh, the Cascadia 
coastline oceans and people project that that is being leveraged out of Oregon State that Oregon Sea Grant's involved in. So disaster preparedness is another area and sort of resilience uh, around those efforts. So right now, those are sort of the areas that 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 I have been in in, in the forefront of of my portfolio uh, in this first month. But that that's not a complete list. Um, and um, I think I'm still defining it. So I'm not gonna give you the, the full vision statement yet. I think it's premature, but uh, that gives you a sense of, of where our, our attention has been. Thank you, thank you very much. Wonderful. If there's no other questions or comments uh, for Dr. Nielsen, I would entertain a motion to forward this recommendation to the state land board at their next meeting for uh, the official appointment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Welcome. I presume the land board will be as ecstatic as we are to bring somebody such as yourself into our organization. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, the Marine Reserves Assessment Update. I'm really excited about this. And before we uh, ask Dr. White to give the presentation, I also invited Carlos Garcia from the Oregon Community Foundation to join us. I really wanted the opportunity for the board to meet Carlos and to just understand the value of this relationship to us. Um, Carlos has been an incredible resource from the outset when Dr. Shelby Walker and I were putting together the funding package for this uh, program. I learned a little bit uh, about Carlos's background. <laughs> I, I did not realize that, I mean, as a program officer for the Oregon Community Foundation, he manages the Oregon Ocean Science Trust Fund. But previously, he was a senior philanthropy advisor for the San Francisco Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and also at the Nature Conservancy. He brought a lot of experience. Uh, he also chairs the board of the environmental grant makers. So he really knows this stuff and it shows while we're working together. It, um, he ensures that our funder reports are filed timely and accurately for the funders that have supported the Marine Reserves um, assessment project and uh, it's just been great to work with. Carlos, um, I'd love to invite you just to introduce yourself a little bit more to the board and tell us more about um, how things are going from your side of the project. Great, great. Yeah, good afternoon everyone and Laura, thank you for the for the kind words and, and introduction. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Carlos Garcia and I'm the program officer for the environment at Oregon Community Foundation. Uh, We've been really pleased uh, to be able to have the uh, Oregon Ocean Science Trust Fund here at OCF, uh, which has really allowed multiple funders to leverage their charitable dollars um, in support of the Marine Reserves Evaluation. Uh, and thanks to all of those donors contributing, we've been able to we've been able to provide a grant to support the um, the evaluation work that's being headed by by Dr. White. Uh, Separately, we also have uh, an Oregon Ocean Conservation Fund um, that we've had for several years, uh, again, allowing uh, multiple funders to pool their resources and supporting the engagement of coast, coastal residences, uh, residents, uh, communities, businesses, really in helping to um, preserve Oregon's oceans. So today I just wanted to uh, have a chance to to say hello to everyone and to thank everyone, uh, the board members and all of the other uh, people for their dedicating their time and expertise um, to this work. So with that, I'll say, uh, I'll say thank you and I'm looking forward to the presentation by Dr. White. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carlos. Um, 
And for those on the call, I think it might be a good idea just to make a um, little bit of a distinction here. So the Oregon Ocean Science Trust can receive funds two different ways. If there are funds coming directly from the legislature, as has been the case with the projects that we're gonna be um, discussing later this afternoon, uh, those can go directly into the Oregon Ocean Science Trust treasury account, and they don't pass through the Oregon Community Foundation. But in the case of um, receiving funds from charitable organizations um, and other foundations, those funds have to go through a third party. So it's wonderful that we're set up to where we can have both pathways for funding um, and I think that that just strengthens our ability to do our job. So I hope that clarifies a little bit. Are there any questions for Carlos before we proceed with the presentation? All right, great. Um, well, thank you very much. So now, uh, yeah, I think we're all excited to here from Dr. Will White, Oregon State University Associate Professor in the uh, Fisheries and Wildlife Department um, with a specialty in fishery oceanography, population dynamics, fisheries management, climate change. Um, he brings a, a lot to the table. I am really interested to hear how things are going and what the status is of the Marine Reserves Assessment Update. So without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to you, Dr. White, to tell us how things are going. Great, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and also thank you to the trust and to the, uh, the foundation for supporting our work. Uh, let me see if I am able to share my screen. And also, Dr. White, we are getting started a little bit behind schedule, but I think that um, we'll, you know, we'll go beyond. We probably will just uh, let you go until at least uh, 110 or 115, just because we, I think uh, I'm running a little bit slow today. So. Okay, I hope you're feeling well. Thanks. Um, Great. I, I, I don't think I'll need to, all that time. I'm, I hope to leave some time for questions at the end. So, all right. Um, so just to remind everyone of, of where we are in this process, uh, you know, the Marine Reserves Program was established back in 2009, uh, and they spent most of 2021 uh, preparing uh, this uh, massive synthesis, synthesis report, and the state had mandated that a uh, a Oregon University team uh, evaluate uh, that, that synthesis report and provide an assessment to the legislature in 2023. So that's what we've been working on. Uh, it was about this time last year that we put together our team and uh, proposed the way we would conduct the assessment. We um, uh, received the materials in January and we're just putting the finishing touches on our assessment right now. I did just want to uh, spend a moment to explain to you who has been conducting the assessment. It's definitely not just me. Uh, so uh, as Laura explained, I'm a fisheries oceanographer. I've done a lot of work on the population dynamics and the design and assessment of marine reserves, uh, particularly on the west coast of the U.S. Um, but the, the group we put together to conduct this assessment uh, spans disciplines. So my, my co-lead investigator here at Oregon State is Kelly Biedenweg, who is a, a human dimensions researcher and has done a lot of work with uh, the human dimensions of marine conservation in the Puget Sound area. Uh, and then my research associate, Jess Hopf, who's also an expert in uh, the population ecology of marine reserves, has been uh, the one who's been doing a lot of the, the actual writing and is the one who read the entire synthesis report uh, very, very carefully to, to make sure we, we were collecting all the materials accurately. Um, and then we were also supported by uh, Kelly's uh, graduate student, Brian Erickson, who's also an expert in, in human dimensions. Um, so that's sort of the Oregon State team that's been leading this work and, and doing most of the writing of the report, but we were supported by this interdisciplinary cast of experts from around the country and really around the world. Uh, so Jen Cassell is a subtitle 
uh, uh, kelp forest and rocky reef researcher uh, down at UC Santa Barbara, who's been doing a lot of work on in the MPA world for the past 20 years or so. Uh, Sarah Lester is an expert in marine reserves and spatial management and the human dimensions of spatial management, a couple of human natural systems. She's based at Florida State University. Uh, Stefan Gelsich is a professor down in Chile, who is an expert in the human dimensions of marine conservation. Uh, Jim Sankirico is a resource economist at UC Davis, who's done work with spatial management and fisheries and marine reserves. Uh, and then Carrie Nichols is a biological oceanographer down at uh, Cal State Northridge, who has expert in sort of near shore biological and chemical oceanography, as well as the population dynamics of, of marine reserves. So uh, we were able to cover all the different bases of the evaluation in terms of uh, you know, from the ecology to the management to the to the economics in, in, in conducting this assessment. Um, so this is the assessment report that was made public back in January, and we had an initial meeting with the ODFW reserves team in, in February to get started on this. Uh, I really I have to congratulate the ODFW Marine Reserves team on putting together this incredibly thorough and massive report. It was also surprisingly friendly to navigate. It, it made our lives so much easier to have everything hyperlinked and, and linked together. And, and you, know, you could tell which things were where, uh, despite the, the immense volume of all the material that was prepared. Um, so in addition to that synthesis report, there was a, a technical appendix for the human dimensions research. There were uh, 42 documents uh, documenting all the different uh, types of ecological monitoring that was done and just other sort of journal articles and, and other materials. So there was a lot of material here. Uh, our charge to evaluate that report was based on the uh, objectives and implementation principles and guidelines that OPAC and STAC had put forth at the beginning of the marine reserves process. Uh, and so they, uh, the stack produced uh, these seven evaluation criteria that drew upon those objectives, principles, and guidelines. And I realized that this is this is as simple as I could make the mapping between those two things. Um, but essentially, each of these seven evaluation criteria, spanning everything from the reserve design to both the uh, ecological factors, socioeconomic factors, and then on down to the to the enforcement, each of those. Uh, captured a different way of assessing different parts of the objectives and principles and guidelines. And so in addressing the, the sort of prompts that were given to us by STAC to, to conduct the report, we went back to the original objectives, principles, and guidelines to make sure that we were aligning our assessment with the, with the intent of OPAC and STAC. Later in this presentation, I'm going to go through each of those seven evaluation criteria and tell you what the what the assessment team concluded about them. Um, but I, I want to just sort of first uh, skip to the overall uh, question that we were asked to, to address, which was, uh, were the marine reserves and the associated MPAs effectively designed and implemented to achieve the goals and objectives that OPAC had set forth? Uh, and our overall conclusion is, is that yes, uh, in general, absolutely they did. Um, and we, in, in our report, we, we catch that as a sort of yes, but here's some things that could be better, right? And, and there's sort of, uh, in our view, there were some evaluation questions that could have been asked in a more nuanced way to elicit a better um, assessment of whether the Marine Reserves Program is, is matching up with OPAC objectives. So maybe we could, we could have answered different questions in a different way, and that would have given a better sense of how the, reserve could be the reserves could be evaluated. Um, and then the, um, it, it's also clear that if the reserve program is going to continue, we need to have uh, continued work and continued resource allocation to the reserves program to, to uh, continue the good work that's been done and, and make it better going forward into the future. Uh, we were also asked to evaluate whether ODFW successfully ex executed the legislative mandates that were set forth. Uh, and we thought that yes, they were, um, but perhaps the assessment team would have um, taken a different approach to evaluating the marine reserve program that has a more adaptive management type of uh, framework where we asked not just where there are positive and negative impacts of the marine reserve program, but what types of impacts, both social and ecological and economic, be they positive or negative, what types of impacts would be expected? Did those impacts occur as expected? And then did anything unexpected occur? Uh, and I think you'll see more of what I mean by that as I get more to the presentation. Um, and then the third sort of overarching thing we were asked to evaluate is whether there were any recommendations we had 
for either administrative actions or legislative proposals. Uh, and, and yes, <laughs> there were. One was to continue the good work that's been doing, that's been going on with, with monitoring and adaptive management, both internally within ODFW and with their ongoing collaborations. Um, there were some of the questions and goals uh, related to the ecology of the marine reserves, particularly the, the resilience of reserves to ongoing disturbances and climate change, um, where um, the program would benefit from, from setting some hypothesis-driven research goals. Um, these are some really cutting edge and emerging areas of research in the marine reserve science. And so um, there's some opportunities there to really be the leading edge of understanding what reserves can do in a resilience uh, component, uh, a resilience standpoint. Um, for the human dimensions side of things, we thought that the, the program would benefit from a strategic research plan that had more and better defined indicators so that the assessments could be uh, compared among each other and, and replicated more effectively. And then finally, we thought that the reserves program would benefit from um, both continued outreach and engagement with the community, uh, but also assessment of that outreach, outreach and engagement to ensure that it's, it's meeting all of the stakeholders' needs and is engaging with stakeholders appropriately, uh, and that ODFW has the, uh, it, it, you know, has the capacity to continue that type of work. Okay, so those are sort of the, the, the big picture evaluations. Uh, I was then going to go through these uh, seven individual evaluation criteria, which touch on different aspects of the Marine Reserves Program uh, and, and discuss what our findings were. Um, some of these are a little bit meatier than others. So we'll spend, I'll spend a lot more time talking about the ecological factors and the socioeconomic characteristics, because that's where a lot of the, um, our recommendations for what can be done in the future come from. Uh, some of the things like design and baseline assessment those are done. That happened in the past, and, and there's not a lot that can be changed, so uh, we don't spend a lot of time uh, discussing those. Um, and then some of the um, some of these evaluation questions were really just sort of, did this happen, yes or no? And so there's not much to be, to be said about that. Uh, so for example, oh yeah, hang on one second, I'll just say that um, in conducting this assessment, we did encounter some challenges that we weren't quite expecting. Um, one is that one characteristic of the Oregon Marine Reserves Program is that the reserves are very specifically not intended to be evaluated as a network, right? There, there are five separate reserves that reach designed in, in slightly different ways with different community groups engaging with them. Um, and they were all by virtue of their physical setting uh, sampled differently uh, with different methods on different schedules. And so in some cases, you know, the evaluations happen on this reserve by reserve scale but some of the evaluation criteria you'd want to apply to a marine reserves program would be happening at the network scale. For example, questions about how far apart reserves are spaced. And so that was a, a challenge to deal with the sort of the, the constraints placed on the process by virtue of, the, of them not being a network. Um, some of the criteria that were put forth by Stack were I think more complex or maybe loaded than the Stack intended, such as asking questions about are they spaced enough to detect statistically significant differences between reserves and control sites? That's actually an incredibly complex question to answer. That's not a yes or no question by any means. Uh, and so we had to dig into the nuances of some of these things. Um, similarly, some of the terms that are used were not necessarily defined by the stack in a way that was uh, really conducive to effective evaluation. So terms like resilience, socioeconomic significance, you have to define those in a way that you can actually evaluate whether uh, the program met those goals. And, and some of them are, are dependent on scale, both time and space. Um, and so we had to dig into the nuances of those and, and take what seemed like simple questions and, and made them uh, reveal that they were more complex. Um, it was also clear that some of the uh, objectives and, and program goals weren't really elicited by the questions that the stack put forth in the charge to the assessment team. Uh, and so we had some questions about whether um, things like the outreach communication plan were being assessed effectively, not just was there outreach and communication, but was it adequate and appropriate? And so we tried to, to answer some of those questions, even though they weren't asked directly. Uh, so now I'm just gonna go through those, uh, those seven uh, aspects of the analysis to, uh, to, to dig into some of the details here. Uh, I'm gonna start actually at the end, which is the, the questions about the enforcement aspects of this. We're just is there an enforcement plan? And yes, there's an enforcement plan. That was a pretty simple one to address. 
Um, the others get to be a little bit more, more complex. Um, the questions about marine reserve design asked a lot about both the ecology and the human dimensions of reserve design. Uh, so for example, the, the charge was, did, they, did the reserves include areas of high natural biodiversity? Did they include special natural features? Uh, and the answer is yes, they, they did. Uh, absolutely, and some analyses were done to, to show that. It was interesting that in the, at the design stage though, that analysis was not, was not done in a statewide way. So there was no comparison of whether there was more biodiversity in the reserves than at other places along the coast that were not considered as potential reserve sites. So if that's something that's really of concern to OPAC and SAC, then that's something to be dug into more, more, uh, more in depth, but it's not clear that that's an important detail. It's clear that these are places of, of biodiversity that have special natural features. Um, did the design process incorporate community interest? Yes, it was a very community-driven process. It's not clear and it's difficult to tell whether that community engagement was was adequate where all community interests represented, it's difficult to tell from the information that we have. Uh, and then finally, were there fewer than 10 sites designed? Yes, we know we just have five million reserves. The second criterion is all about the baseline assessments that were done. Uh, so around the time of implementation uh, to in order to facilitate longer term adaptive management. Uh, and these were both ecological in nature and then human dimensions in nature. Um, and so the questions about the ecological uh, baseline data collection were all about you know, did, were, did the data collection happen? Did it happen in an appropriate way using appropriate methods? And was the timing of the collection driven by the objectives of the main reserve program? Um, the answers to all those questions were yes. Uh, it's, it was unfortunate in some ways that, um, you know, just because of resources and just because in some places it's difficult to, to get out on the water in, in the coastal Oregon, there was less sampling than, than had originally, originally been planned. Um, there was a lot of method development that happened in this time. And so things were tried and they didn't work. So we tried different things. And uh, eventually methods that were appropriate for each location were developed. Um, so the answer is generally yes, but maybe not as um, as perfectly as, as could be imagined in an ideal world. But that's not to say that, that uh, it wasn't done very well. Uh, on the human dimension side, uh, similar methods. Were the data collected? Could the methods be effectively used to detect change and were the methods tailored to the different reserve sites? And the answer is again, yes, appropriate methods were used. They were, they were done at the time of the baseline. Um, an interesting aspect of the human dimensions data collection relative to the ecological data collection. The, the, the problem with marine reserves anywhere in the world is that you don't start collecting baseline data until after you know where they're going to be, right? That's, that's usually the case. In the ecological setting, that's usually not a big problem. Things won't start changing right away when, when uh, fishing stops. Um, but in the human dimension setting, the, the baseline data collection period, uh, even if it was before marine reserve regulations went into place, that's going to include a lot of periods of time when people already know what's happening. And they are, they're thinking about the marine reserves. They're thinking about potential uh, uh, downsides or upsides of those reserves. And so, so baseline data are still sort of part of uh, in the reserve timing process. And so it's important to keep that in mind in that the context of that data collection when evaluating human dimensions data. Um, okay, so now getting into the ecological factors. These are questions about um, uh, you know, the, the protection of biodiversity in the reserves. Uh, some of these are similar to the questions that I discussed in the context of the baseline ecological monitoring. Um, for example, do the sites have high biodiversity? Yes, they do have high biodiversity. You know, they do have biodiversity. Uh, they, they, they do uh, capture some of what we expect or some of the most important biodiverse habitats in Oregon. Um, but it's, if the question is really, are they more biodiverse than other random locations along the coastline? We just don't know because we don't have those data. And so again, if it's really important to make sure that the reserves are in the most biodiverse locations, then more data would be needed to evaluate that question but it seems like appropriate methods were used to ensure that these habitats were placed in high, highly biodiverse locations. Um, there's one exception, which is that uh, estuaries were brought up as a potential key habitat during the design process, but none of the marine reserves contain an estuary. And so that might be something that the program could consider, uh, whether that's a, a missing habitat feature that should be represented. Okay. A number of the evaluation questions in, on the ecological side uh, were about what the reserves bring to the table in terms of 
the resilience of marine ecosystems to stressors. And these could be uh, human-driven stressors or uh, sort of background environmental variability. Um, and these are really difficult questions to answer uh, and, and probably questions that wouldn't be answerable in any marine reserves program in the time frame that we're dealing with. Um, this is a really new area of science. You know, as climate change becomes a reality in the ocean and we begin to realize what's, what's happening, uh, there's been a lot of um, hope that marine reserves could provide uh, places of higher resilience and, and, and places where there are refugia from climate change. Uh, but the degree to which that's a possibility is still very much an open question. So there are some hypothesized benefits of, of uh, marine reserves to various types of stressors. If you have larger populations of bigger animals, they may be able to resist certain types of disturbances more, more effectively and then uh, sort of replenish disturbed populations more effectively. It's difficult to show that that's happening uh, until you've had a big disturbance and then you see that um, that that type of recovery has been faster because you have marine reserves. Uh, but even in that sense, even if you have that case of a disturbance and then a response to it, it's still difficult to evaluate the counterfactual. How fast would the recovery have been? How much resilience would we have seen without marine reserves? Right? So determining whether reserves provide resilience is really a difficult challenge and something that ODFW has an opportunity now to, to lead research on or, or collaborate with research on to figure out what it means to have resilient reserves uh, and how you would detect whether that's happening or not. Uh, and so continuing the long-term monitoring um, and continuing the collaborative research they're doing in this, in this vein uh, would be a really important recommendation. Uh, and you'll start to see that I've put some of the recommendations that the assessment team came up with in, in blue text at the bottom of these slides. Um, the next ecological question I wanna to touch on is that uh, there was a lot of questions about the, the reserves size and their spacing and whether the both the, both of the size and spacing between the reserves were adequate to detect differences. Um, size and spacing were definitely considered during the design phase back in the 2008-2010 period. Um, but the question about whether they are spaced far enough apart from reference sites to detect changes is really a loaded question because detecting change depends on how much change you'd expect to see uh, sort of the, the, the expected difference between reserves and control sites, not, not necessarily just are they far enough apart. Um, and so that's answering that question is impossible as a yes or no, uh, but it's something that if there's interest in knowing about the ability to detect uh, differences, that's an opportunity for collaborative research to predict what the expected effect might be and predict how well they could be uh, detected. And that's an ongoing area of research in the ecology of marine reserves. Um, there were a lot of questions about the way uh, species and species diversity were measured. Uh, and, and we agreed that ODFW had chosen appropriate methods and, and had been um, adaptive in their sampling methods to make sure that they were sampling things effectively and not wasting time and resources on methods that weren't appropriate. Um, it will take more time to detect some of the changes that they're looking for, especially changes in species diversity, just because it takes many, many years of sampling to ensure you're correctly capturing all the diversity in a location. Um, and then we agreed with some of ODFW's proposals uh, about the way they had changed their sampling and the way they should be continuing uh, to sample in the future. They were suggesting uh, switching up some of the ways they anal analyzed uh, uh, focal or, or, or key species and, and really changing that to focus on just the species that were most abundant in the data set, where you could actually have the biggest sample sizes and the most statistical power. Um, and then now that they've done you know, 10 years of experimentation with different sampling methods, it seems clear that it's time to, to take the methods that are working best and just continue those and, and, and stop experimenting with different sampling methods, but continue with the ones we know that work um, in order to establish longer term data sets. Um, they've got a real opportunity for that too. Um, and then, you know, finally, uh, you know, are, are the data accessible? Absolutely. Were the methods adaptable that they used? Yes, absolutely. So they're, they, uh, they've done all that very well. Uh, and now they have opportunities to do, to do more and continue uh, managing the reserves adaptively. Okay, moving on to the socioeconomic factors. This is where we had a little bit of difficulty um, uh, 
uh, assessing whether the the um, questions that Stack was asking about the reserve program were addressed properly. Um, one of the first questions was, you know, did the program develop criteria for adverse impacts? Uh, and in our judgment, not quite. Um, and that's because the the human dimensions data that were collected were aggregated in ways that could have obscured impacts. So, for for example, there is potentially a lot of heterogeneity in the impacts on fishing fleets across the Oregon coast, where the effects of some reserves might have been greater on the fishing fleets in that area than in other reserves. But if you aggregate all of those analyses at a statewide level, it becomes difficult to pick out those nuances, right? Um, th there was also not a clear definition set forth by Stack on, on what it means to be sociologically or, or economically significant in terms of measuring impacts. Um, and so we think that the response to that would be to develop a research plan that establishes what those criteria for, you know, what a meaningful impact is and, and develop monitoring that would address those, uh, as well as considering alternative holistic assessment frameworks that could account for those heterogeneity and impacts where you have different things happening at different parts of the coast. And so you have to, res you know, analyze those things at that scale rather than at, at an aggregated scale. Uh, the next question there is, is, is there evidence for socioeconomic impacts of the reserves? And there is evidence for both positive and negative impacts. Uh, on the social side of things, um, a lot of the uh, negative impacts were you know, social conflicts, conflicts between different user groups or interest groups. Uh, but there were, uh, the, the analyses reported some positive outcomes, such as opportunities for greater dialogue between those groups and greater understanding going forward. Um, on the economic side, there was a definite economic cost to some fishing groups that, that they reported. Um, and they also reported that there were no, um, that some of the expected positive effects didn't necessarily materialize. So effects such as on uh, you know, benefits to ecotourism or the, the assignment of uh, research contracts, some uh, stakeholders perceived that those things didn't happen. Um, so our recommendations on that front would be to you know, continue to human dimensions research in order to elicit more of this information over time for more groups. Um, it wasn't clear from the assessment whether um, tribes and tribal interests had really been engaged with as part of the Green Reserves Program, and so that would be an opportunity. Um, and then our recommendation for evaluating those positive and negative impacts is to consider what the expected impact would be and whether the impact was more or less negative or more or less positive than that expectation, right? But we know from prior research and from other marine reserve programs that we do expect certain types of economic costs to the fishing fleet from, especially from the initial implementation of marine reserves. The question is, you know, were the impacts more negative than that expectation or not? And that might be a more productive question to answer rather than just asking were there, were there costs or benefits. Uh, the next criteria was all about community engagement. Uh, and our overall take on this line of assessment was that uh, a lot of the questions posed by stack were sort of yes or no, was there communication? Um, but it's more, uh, more appropriate to ask whether that communication was effective, right? We need assessments to see, are we reaching the right, um, uh, the right stakeholder groups, the right community groups? Uh, and is the, is the mode and, and, and content of that communication effective? Um, and so the, the first question in this in this section is, you know, was the public involved? Were, were they engaged with the Marine Reserve Program? And the answer is yes, but it's unclear if all relevant stakeholders were engaged. For example, I mentioned the tribes and that's one, one outstanding question. Uh, and so we recommend an analysis to, to identify potential stakeholder groups that are left out of the Marine Reserve Program and could be engaged with better. Um, has there been outreach and engagement? Yes, and in fact, back in, I believe it was 2014, the Marine Reserve Program developed a strategic plan for doing just that. Uh, we still uh, argue that there could be an opportunity to, to include stakeholders that might be left out from that plan, right? Um, has there been collaborative research in the reserves with, uh, with you know, outside academic research groups and with, uh, with uh, members of the fishing fleet? Uh, and yes, there has been. Uh, there's a, a perception among some of the uh, fishing community that there was not equitable allocation of, of research contracts. And so that's an opportunity to potentially find different ways for groups to contribute to the Green Reserves Program and potentially more equitably distribute uh, uh, grant funds and, and contracts for that type of work. Um, and then are, are the results communicated? Are scientific results from the reserves communicated and are the, the regulations surrounding the reserves communicated? Um, and again, yes, they are. there are communications happening. Um, 
there's no assessment happening to determine how effective those communications are in the case of the scientific results. Um, and it seems that the, in terms of the regulations, community knowledge of what is and is not allowed in the reserves is, is lower than, than we might hope, but it is growing over time, right? So we, in, in both of these cases, we have opportunities to um, set goals for the types of communication outcomes that you could hope for, and then assess whether those goals are met. Um, and there's also an opportunity to provide more resources to actually have a full-time communication staffer, uh, which is a currently vacant position, um, to make sure that that communication is actually happening. Um, and then the, uh, let's see, yes, this is the, the last one in this, in the community engagement is, you know, are there education and economic opportunities? This sort of loops back to some things I've mentioned before. Um, the answer is yes, but maybe more could be done. Um, there's an opportunity for different types of economic development, such as ecotourism. Um, and there's potentially the, the need to offer different or more diverse pathways for research contracts to, with fishing vessels to occur in order to improve a more equitable distribution of, of those funds. Um, moving on to the, the last uh, criteria I'll talk about, which is all about governance. Do the MPA, do the marine reserves allow uh, free transit and open access? And they do. Uh, is resource management using the monitoring data that are being produced? Yes, they are. They're being used uh, not just by ODFW, but, but um, uh, by uh, NOAA and, and potentially other users. So there's a, a growing opportunity for these data sets to be used. Are there monitoring and evaluation plans? Um, this is one where there is an overall monitoring and evaluation plan for all the reserves. Uh, they're not separate monitoring and evaluation plans, which is what OPAC and STAC seem to be intending with the way they asked that question. It's unclear if that's necessary or not. Um, is research management using the monitoring data? Yes, they are, at least for the ecological data. Um, it's, there's potential to use the human inventions data, but it's not being used in that way yet. Um, and then do the reserves have management plans with these sort of best practices sort of objectives that, that really address the, the, the issue of adaptive management? And the, the, the term used here is, is smart objectives, so specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-oriented. Uh, and our assessment was that they do in part. So some of those smart components are, are followed, um, but what's, what's um, potentially missing is the time-oriented aspect of that and the opportunity for actual adaptive management to happen in the sense of conducting, setting objectives, conducting monitoring, and then having a mechanism for those um, monitoring results to be linked back and compared to the objectives to decide whether changes needed to be made in, in the way management happens at the research program. Um, and there's there's not, this, this is essentially, this process is the adaptive management plan. There's not one necessarily past 2023. And so that, that this is a, again, an opportunity to develop a, a, a comprehensive adaptive management plan for the green resource program moving past 2023. Okay, so I've hit all the high points of what we were asked to assess and how we've uh, how we've responded to those. Um, I just wanted to end by, by returning to those um, uh, recommend, the overall recommendations that we're making in terms of uh, uh, you know, continuing and improving adaptive management and monitoring, continuing and improving human dimensions monitoring, and uh, ensuring that there are defined goals and assessment for outreach and engagement. Um, and frankly, that there are resources to going to ODFW to support these goals. You know, if, the, if these are important goals for uh, for the state, then ODFW needs the resources to be able to continue the work that they're doing. And uh, I will stop there and I'm happy to, to take questions. Great, thank you, Dr. White. Um, let's see, if you wanna maybe stop your screen share, sure. and get back to the main screen and I'll open up to questions first from the board. We'll go uh, about 10 minutes or so on questions. If there's time, I'm happy to engage questions from the audience. You can type your name in the chat and I'll call on you in order, but we'll start with our board members first. And also Dr. Nielsen, I would invite you to participate with us as if you were already on our board. 
Laura, before we take questions, can I just add one more thing, um, please, which is that the, the actual written report will be finalized and submitted to stack on uh, July 15th. So it- Oh, wow, you are close. Okay, yeah. next week. <clears throat> Um, I've got a, uh, a question in terms of uh, I, the original RFP had some questions about uh, interactive with the legislative uh, public part, part of part of this. Um, I, you know, having not seen the the way that you rolled out your communications and assessments, could you could you give us a little more about in, in terms of outreach into uh, the community and the users or the the public, uh, give us an idea of how you did that and, and was there communication with uh, our legislative parties? Are you asking whether in their, in, in the ODFW synthesis report, whether the Marine Reserves Program had engaged the legislative no, um, your so assessment, our, your assessment, yeah. So our assessment, um, we've been engaging with STAC during the assessment process uh, and with the idea that STAC is gonna communicate that to the legislative bodies uh, after the, the report is finalized. So we've not engaged with any legislators or, or committees at this time. So how were you sampling? Um, I mean, you were just asking questions, but in terms of, you know, the outreach, did you have a sampling strategy that you were trying to achieve? Or I just, I'm trying to digest that part of the. Well, we were, we were assessing the outreach that the outreach activities that ODFW had done over the past decade. And so did you document, you know, that kind of outreach, you know, where it went and. and right. Yeah. That, so that's all documented in the, in the synthesis report. And then we summarize our assessment of that in our assessment report. And yes, so they had a long list of different activities, different events, different modes of communication in their um, in the outreach section of that synthesis report. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to find out whether you found out, went to the sources to determine whether or not what they're, you know, uh, a, a fact checking or some sort of a sub 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 sampling of that, that I'm not making myself really clear. Oh, I understand. So no, but we did not- to validate do, yeah. as sort of a peer review where you go back to some of that. Given, given the timeline of this, we did not have the, the time or the resources to do, to go through, to make contact with user groups and conduct that type of survey work. That would be a, a huge endeavor. Uh, and given sort of the five month timeline that we had, we were just going on our evaluation of what ODFW said they had done and what they documented in, you know, there were a number of, especially on the human dimension side, there were a number of peer reviewed articles that they had, uh, they provided to us that had come out of the reserves program that we were assessing, they were basing our assessment on. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, thank you, Dr. White for the presentation. Um, still trying to kind of digest some of the, the key takeaways um, and also want to be, uh, in, in asking questions, want to respect the fact that all the information you assessed was from the synthesis documents. You're not actually out there doing, asking these questions yourself, but you're basing all of your work off of a document that, that was carried out by ODFW. Um, so being sensitive to that, and I have not, I haven't read the entire synthesis document, um, but I am, I'm, uh, I was trying to wrap my mind a little bit around um, some of the key takeaways with respect to economic and social impacts. And you teased out a dynamic um, in your presentation where some of the impacts are uh, don't pop because they're aggregated across the reserves where if you look at a specific reserve, they, you may see a different level or a different scale of impact. Um, and I think that that was, I think that was mostly with respect to economic impact, but um, maybe, and this is maybe um, a question more for ODFW. Um, 
But when in looking at social Im impacts, you, you, you called out that phenomenon and then you identified um, where there were concrete examples of adverse impacts, adverse economics in, impacts to fishing communities. Um, and I, um, it, and then also that um, some of the anticipated positive uh, impacts were, did not accrue or were not able to be, or, or were not um, cataloged or noted. Um, and my question is, um, with regards to the economic impacts on fisheries, is the information in the uh, in the synthesis report on um, is it fishery specific or is that information also aggregated across the reserves or is your takeaway that negative adverse economic impacts is, is that an aggregate takeaway or is that is there further information about what fishery was impacted in what region and with respect to what reserve? And then similarly, similarly on the anticipated but um, um, not noted uh, positive economic impacts, are those is is that an aggregate takeaway, or is that or are there instances of a specific impact that was anticipated relative to a specific reserve and that was not seen? So just look, thinking about the the level at which those takeaways um, were noted and whether they were aggregated across Oregon or specific to one one reserve or not. Sorry if that's not an articulate question, but I'm trying to just tease out yeah. that dynamic. Sure. Yeah. That's that. There's a lot in that question. Um, and and I should uh, I I want to say as a just to start that, that I I sh uh, unfortunately my my co PI Kelly Biedenweg who, who really uh, ran the human dimension side of the assessment is in Costa Rica right now and couldn't join us. Um, so she I, I might have to ask her to follow up some of these questions to make sure I'm capturing it correctly. But yes, the um, essentially the some of the negative economic impacts did have greater effects in some reserves than in others that came through in sort of the, the fishermen interviews and things like that that were reported. Um, and those came in the, in the forms of having to travel further to, uh, you know, to go to different fishing grounds, the ones that they would have used before, potentially having to travel under more adverse weather conditions to get to those grounds, things of that nature. And that happens in some locations and not others, right? Because some locations weren't uh, heavily fished beforehand. Um, and so aggregating at the overall, you know, statewide scale where there are ne negative effects, um, you know, maybe on average, perhaps not, but, but there could have been, you know, there's heterogeneity in that. Um, and then I would have to look back at the, uh, at my notes to answer your question about uh, ecotourism. Um, since I did not, I didn't write that part of our assessment. But, the, th thank you. That's okay. Um, it, yeah. it wouldn't not appropriate for time here, and I and you can look at the synthesis report. But maybe a maybe a opportunity for a follow up question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of information here, and so it's difficult to, to paint these broad uh, broad characterization. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Nielsen. Um, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on the, um, you know, there was a, I had a curiosity about the, um, the uh, proposed, the lack of positive impacts. <laughs> it's a little bit of a, of a, and uh, is that a perception or was that analyzed? Like, were there targets of expected positive impacts and there was an economic, socioeconomic analysis and those were not there? Or was that sort of a, an interview and if you know that maybe you don't know, but I'm just, I'm trying to understand whether that was an actual analysis that was done or whether that's a perception on the part of community members uh, that were interviewed. Yeah, that is, you know what, I, I do not want to answer definitively yeah. on that because okay. I think there were a few different elements that led to us drawing that conclusion. And uh, I'm not the one who, who dug into the details of that yeah. part of the analysis. Yeah. Um, but certainly there, there was a, a lot of that is driven by uh, interviews and and public perceptions. Yes, that as opposed to an economic analysis per se. Uh, is what you're. But anyway, yeah. we'll, we'll follow the, the, up on that. Yeah, we'll follow up on that. The examples I'm thinking of come from the interview part of the process, but I, I can't definitively say that there wasn't also an economic analysis without going back and rereading that section. Thank you. Hi, 
I do have one member of the public with a question, but I want to continue to offer time to the board if uh, any more questions um, are here. Okay, I think we have time for um, not a lot of time. Charlie Plyben, if you could just maybe summarize down to one question. I have two members of the public with questions and this is such an important opportunity. I wanna make sure that we allow for that time. Thanks, uh, I'll be quick and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Will, great presentation, um, really fantastic. I've been involved with Marine Reserve since uh, uh, seven years before they happened. Um, so I appreciated all of the work uh, by you. I'm, I'm curious, um, if there was an opportunity or if there is an opportunity for this board to hear maybe an overview of the synthesis report. Um, I felt like that was kind of a missing piece that might have tied some of this assessment together. My big question though, is it is the assessment purely based on that piece of paper? I mean, it was like seven years of politics and human emotions and dialogue. And so was there any conversations? Did you talk to ODF and W? Did you talk to anybody as part of the assessment or was it purely just based on that synthesis report? Um, I, th I think is my key question. Yeah, so there's two aspects to that. One, one is interesting in that the, the way the RFP for this assessment was structured was that anyone who had been involved in any sort of advisory or monetary capacity with the reserves program at any time couldn't be part of the assessment. And so, you know, we were all people who who had not either, you know, I, I hadn't been a professor at OSU long enough to really engage with, with the Oregon Reserves uh, program. And so we, you know, a lot of our expertise came from outside of Oregon because those folks were, were the ones who were not conflicted in a way to assess this. So we haven't been engaged in that political process, right? Um, and then the, the second answer is that we did, there was a, a number of different back and forth conversations with ODFW to clarify things in the report and make sure we had the right information that we were interpreting things correctly. Um, but it was an assessment of that synthesis report. Yes, that was what we were asked to do. And thank you, Charlie, for the question and also noting whether or not the board would like to hear an overview of the synthesis report. And I think I'll bring that up at the end of our meeting and other business, we'll have that discussion. It's a good question. And final question to uh, Joe Liebezite, and then we'll be moving on. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair uh, Anderson. Uh, and thank you, Will, for the presentation. My name is Joe Liebezite, uh, Portland Audubon, also OPAC member. Um, you know, just at the start of your presentation, Will, you mentioned the challenge of um, doing the, I think it was the ecological assessment because each site was, each marine reserve was treated as an individual unit because the, the definition uh, by OPAC is to treat them as a system. Um, and at the same time, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned that moving forward, a rec big recommendation is to do longer term ecological monitoring of these sites because some of the things that uh, ODFW is interested in looking at, just, there just wasn't enough time. Um, so I guess what that leads me to is, would you recommend that in order from a purely scientific perspective that there should be consideration by OPAC um, and the program at large to consider moving towards a definition of this uh, uh, from a system to a network of marine reserves so they could be more adequately um, monitored as a unit across across reserves um, as we move forward with this um, program. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I would say there's two dimensions of that. There's, you know, almost everything in the, in the reserves program is separated into the ecological context and the human dimensions context. And I don't, I don't know whether it makes sense to think of things as a network in the human dimensions context because the, the economics and the sociology of the coast is so different along the entire Oregon coast. Um, from an ecological standpoint, um, whether or not uh, you know, policymakers and managers want to treat them as a network, they are ecologically working as a network in the sense that there is undoubtedly connectivity of organisms between the reserves, right? And a lot of the benefits that would, that 
the reserves program uh, is is hoping to achieve that OPAC is asked to see things like resilience to disturbances are things that would occur at a, at a coastwide scale. Uh, and if there are benefits accruing inside reserves where they can build up larger populations that then help the entire coast be more resilient, that's a, a network property. Uh, and so there are some things where it would, I think, make sense to ask, you know, how do these work as a network? Is there is is the reserve network as a whole operating together? Uh, while keeping in mind that all those locations are very different from a uh, you know physical oceanographic standpoint and from an ecological standpoint, and so those those nuances would have to be maintained. But you know, the state of Oregon is a, is a well connected um, uh, ecological system. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much for presenting what is a very complex topic and project in a very short period of time. Uh, perhaps we'll have more opportunities to um, grapple with the, the, whole, um, the whole assessment as it's published and uh, some of those questions can be answered. So uh, thank, thank you so much. I hope you can continue to stay with us for the rest of our meeting, Dr. White, and we'll be hearing probably more from you again in the future. Okay, thanks very much for your time. Unfortunately, I'm not able to stay for much longer, but uh, I do okay. appreciate your time today. Thank you. Right, so um, we're running just a little behind schedule, but I'm not worried about it. We've got some places we can catch up uh, after the break. But before that, I'm really um, interested to hear from Joanna Lyle next. Joanna is a Blue Carbon Fellow uh, with the Nature Conservancy and Oregon Sea Grant. And she is taking on a project to investigate blue carbon in Oregon and its potential to contribute to the state's carbon mitigation and sequestration strategies. So she's going to give us an overview of her work and we'll have some time for questions after. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So you should be seeing my presentation and not the notes, is that correct? Okay, great. Um, I'm really excited to receive an invitation to present on my Oregon Sea Grant Fellowship work on blue carbon with the Nature Conservancy. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson, again, for the invitation to speak. I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Joanna Lyle. I'm an Oregon Sea Grant Blue Carbon Fellow working with the Nature Conservancy. I received my bachelor's in biology from the University of Oregon in 2019, and I continued at the U of O for my master's in marine biology at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology in Charleston. I currently do live and work in Coos Bay. My graduate work focused on the vertical migration of pyrosomes, these planktonic jellies whose numbers became hugely abundant off the coast several years ago, following a marine heat wave. And without getting too far into those details, um, pyrosomes are like a large number of other oceanic animals who remain in the dark depths of the waters during the day to avoid predation and migrate to the productive surface waters at night to feed. And these daily migration of animals from the ocean surface to depths creates that connectivity among vertical ocean zones and facilitates the transfer of carbon to the deep sea. In October, I started Oregon Sea Grant's Natural Resource Policy Fellowship with the Nature Conservancy. And again, the focus of my fellowship is that exploration of Oregon's blue carbon as a climate strategy. There are a number of individuals and organizations thinking about and working on blue carbon, and there are ongoing collaborative efforts to give blue carbon that full consideration alongside terrestrial carbon pathways as a natural climate solution. So taking a step back, just what is blue carbon? And blue carbon is any carbon stored and sequestered in coastal and marine env environments. Plants photosynthesize and draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide into living biomass where it may be stored, built up in the soils, or consumed by animal grazers. That sequestration is the long-term storage of carbon, and it occurs when that carbon-rich biomass produced makes its way to durable carbon sinks, such as marine sediments and the wood of long-lived trees, such as our coastal spruces. The bulk of blue carbon science has been studied in the tropics, focusing especially on mangroves and seagrasses, 
but that's not too applicable to the Pacific Northwest. Um, but blue carbon in the Pacific Northwest has only recently gained attention and the resources for research. Tidal wetlands and seagrasses have been the primary area of focus due to their ease of access for study, the existence of carbon standards and methodologies, and a relatively simple mode of blue carbon production. But it's important to, cons to consider carbon pathways outside of the estuary that may have the capacity for producing, storing, and ultimately sequestering carbon. These frontier blue carbon pathways may include kelp forests, long-lived marine vertebrates such as whales and fish, marine phytoplankton, seaweed, aquaculture, and it may turn out that some of these ultimately do not pan out as effective blue carbon strategies, but our goal is just to ask the question and see what may or may not be worth pursuing. My fellowship will have three main deliverables. The first is an overview of Oregon relevant blue carbon research. And this may include any studies or reports in the broader Pacific Northwest as there's not really a lot of available research that was conducted in Oregon. We will identify the gaps, uncertainties, and opportunities for various types of blue carbon pathways, as well as identifying potential next steps. The second product will be an initial estimate of the contribution of blue carbon to Oregon's climate mitigation goals. These will take into account our current rough estimates of blue carbon ecosystem extent and sequestration rate to better articulate the role blue carbon can play in greenhouse gas mitigation. The last product is a stakeholder analysis. There are currently people in the blue carbon space doing work, and we hope to document partners and opportunities to work together. So in the next slides, I'll go into a bit of detail on those. So the first um, blue carbon research science synthesis is aimed to better articulate the broad status of blue carbon science in Oregon. The existing work has tended to focus on research uh, on a national or global level, or it only summarizes a portion of Oregon's important blue carbon ecosystems. The goal is to read and digest scientific papers and reports, each of which can take a significant amount of time to get through and make those contents and findings more accessible and to save you a lot of time. We especially wanna highlight areas where there are uncertainties, either due to gaps in the data and need for understanding local variability or potential vulnerabilities where the capacity for carbon storage may decrease due to human effects. These unknowns and uncertainties will help guide our next steps. This work is in progress, um, but it's expected to be available in the fall. And then I'm gonna take some time and go through some of the initial findings from this work. Um, so we're familiar with tidal wetlands, uh, their ecosystems located within estuaries and they're regularly inundated with salt water as the tide comes in. Carbon is produced through photosynthesis again and stored within the biomass, especially woody biomass of living plants or in the soils um, where, dead where dead material um, accretes and accumulates um, within the soils and is stabilized by the root systems. And depending on who you talk to, the main tidal wetland classes includes salt marshes or emergent wetlands, scrub shrub wetlands that are composed of woody shrubs like willows, and forested tidal wetlands, also known as spruce swamps, because Sitka spruce is the primary canopy forming species. The vast majority of Oregon's historic tidal wetlands have been lost or undergone change due to diking and vegetation conversion. The capacity for carbon storage varies among these different wetland types. Carbon stocks appear to increase with elevation and the highest stocks are associated with those spruce swamps. One complication within wetlands is that carbon benefits may be offset by increased greenhouse gas emissions due to the lower salinity. And there are currently studies underway to look into this question. Tidal wetland forests have gained a lot of interest as carbon storage is on par with tropical mangroves and Oregon's old growth forests. But unfortunately, much of their historic extent has been lost and may be very difficult to restore. The scrub shrub, however, appears to have some promising carbon benefits um, and is relatively easy to restore, but it's lacking in data. It's also important to consider that restoring the natural tidal flow to these impounded wetlands that have been diked has a strong climate benefit by reducing those potent greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a key impact of blue carbon restoration aside from that carbon sequestration alone. 
Oregon's estuary wetlands also inc include these eelgrass meadows. Like salt marshes, eelgrasses occur relatively low in the estuary and it's often submerged by the tide. The carbon storage mechanism is similar to that of the tidal wetlands where sediment is stabilized by the roots of the eelgrass. Pacific Northwest eelgrass beds have lower carbon stocks and sequestration rates relative to tidal wetlands, but greenhouse gas emissions are likely minimized because of the high salinity. Carbon storage can be highly variable depending on site characteristics, sediment load, hydrology, um, and those specifics need to be studied. There's high connectivity between eelgrass and terrestrial and subtidal habitats, which is really exciting. Much of the sediment carbon within eelgrass beds is actually not produced by eelgrass itself, but is imported into the system. This isn't great in terms of carbon credits because those methodologies require that credited carbon must be produced and stored within the same ecosystem. But those standards necessarily understate eelgrass carbon services because of the network of connections to other ecosystems, such as near, near shore seaweed. Um, eelgrass does experience cyclical losses and we need to identify those drivers as well as mapping its historic extent. Moving on to oceanic blue carbon, seaweed and kelp are of recent interest as a source of blue carbon. Kelp and seaweeds are marine algae, um, also called macroalgae, that's a term you'll hear quite often. They're similar to plants in that they use sunlight and dissolve carbon dioxide to photosynthesize and incorporate that carbon into their living biomass. Depending on the species, macroalgae are relatively short-lived and turn over on a yearly basis. Large, robust species like kelp are more resistant to grazing and decomposition, which may enhance their carbon export. And that seasonal production of carbon may be dislodged or converted into particles of detritus that is exported to deep ocean sediments where it can be sequestered. Even up to a quarter of carbon stored within eelgrass meadow sediments, as I mentioned before, is from seaweed. With kelp, there are many unanswered questions and Oregon seaweed studies are really needed. Quantifying carbon sequestered from macroalgae is difficult because the carbon sink is disconnected in time and in space from the carbon production. Kelp forests are complex and the jury is still out on to whether to consider seaweed as a net positive for blue carbon sequestration. This is especially important given that Oregon kelp forests are vulnerable to marine heat waves, herbivory, and human activity. I wanna take a moment to shout out some of my colleagues seaweed work at TNC. Another Sea Grant fellow, Megan Considine, is doing an investigation into seaweed aquaculture. Her report will explore the market opportunities and will be available in early 2023. One component is the blue carbon co-benefits and the direct carbon benefits are expected to vary by location and growing methods and species. But I expect the largest benefit from a carbon lens in terms of seaweed aquaculture is um, those seaweed products as a low carbon substitute. TNC is also working on mapping current seaweed habitat extent from existing data sets in the marine reserves and using those data to create a model predicting suitable habitat. We don't have great maps of kelp and seaweed cover, including those important understory species because um, the near shore area is really hard to sample without um, putting divers or ROVs in the water. This method can be used to help identify historic extent, restoration sites, and extrapolate to potential kelp coverage within reserves and potentially expand it to the rest of the coast. What I've discussed up to this point has been fairly well accepted as blue carbon pathways, but there are others that push that idea for, further. Current definitions of blue carbon is often based on those carbon standards for crediting, as I mentioned, but we could get similar benefits by increasing other pools of oceanic carbon. Marine fishes and whales include large long-lived species who can store large amounts of carbon within their living biomass. And we could think of them as mobile carbon resources. When they die, their carbon may sink to the deep sea where it's unlikely to return to the atmosphere. Additionally, the vertical migration of these animals may physically transport carbon or fertilize carbon or fertilized phytoplankton blooms, excuse me, which absorbs large amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide. When it comes to frontier blue carbon, there's a lot more questions than there are answers, including identifying target species and potential modes of action. 
This is a dialogue that we should be having, but is missing from the, the current blue carbon conversations. Moving on to the second fellowship product, we'll use that best data available from the science synthesis to roughly estimate the contribution of blue carbon to Oregon's natural and working lands. We'll apply fairly simple formulas to get a first estimate of the potential capacity um, of blue carbon to contribute to Oregon's greenhouse gas mitigation goals. This estimate, of course, will be improved over time as better data becomes available regarding ecosystem extent and sequestration rate, among other important variables. But the goal here is to spark dialogue so that we can move towards a better quantification of Oregon's blue carbon. And this is expected to be finished by the end of the year. The last piece is the stakeholder analysis. We're conducting a round of interviews of the people working in um, or adjacent to the blue carbon space, such as in research, monitoring, restoration, advocacy, and policy. Our conversations result in spiraling connections to other stakeholders who we otherwise would not have thought to talk to. Uh, this analysis will attempt to document these connections with the understanding that it's a snapshot in time um, and expected to be, to be completed um, mid-fall. Here are some initial things that we're learning from stakeholders. First, that there's a real need for a clear definition and communication of blue carbon that includes ocean habitats in addition to estuaries. Um, expanding the definition of carbon really, really expands who thinks of their work as blue carbon work. Um, on that vein, there are few people doing blue carbon focused work, even if their work has blue carbon benefits and intersections. Many of our conversations are really echoing the same findings from the science synthesis. A few of them are that understory kelp and seaweed should be studied alongside the canopy forming kelp. Again, long lived marine vertebrates can be thought and can be thought of as those managed carbon pools. Um, there's emphasis on scrub shrub wetlands as, as promising sequestration habitats and that eelgrass and seaweeds are very sensitive to human effects and should be studied. Just to summarize these deliverables again, the synthesis of the blue carbon research will be available in fall with initial estimates completed by the end of the year. The snapshot of blue carbon stakeholders will be available in the fall. I hope that the OOS has, find this, has found this information valuable and I'm happy to take any questions. Also, um, just to, to shout out, if you think of anyone that I should be uh, meeting with or talking with, please do send me an email. I put my email at the bottom of the screen there. Wow, thank you so much, Joanna. Great work that you and your colleagues at TNC and Sea Grant are up to. Um, if you, yep, there you go. Uh, we'll open up for questions, uh, same format as before, to the board first and members of the public, uh, send me a message in the chat if you would like to get on the list. Hey, Laura. So. Yes. Hi, Christine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That um, That is such an important emerging area. Thank you for your synopsis um, of that and, and uh, bringing into light the importance of, of temperate systems as, as good storage units. Um, uh, being a sort of uh, more animal centric uh, in my, my thoughts, and uh, you didn't mention shellfish at all in your sequestration. And to me, um, I look at some of the um, some of the old literature in terms of really what what there was in in um, just say uh, native uh, mussels and oysters and all of that in terms of of sequestering uh, sort of a long-term residues in the substrates. And I just wondered whether you pursuing that at all in some of your um, calculations and estimations. Thank you for that question. The thinking about shellfish is really interesting because it's, it's actually a fairly complicated question when it comes to ocean chemistry, um, because 
counterintuitively, the formation of those uh, carbonate shells that oysters and other, other shellfish have, um, it actually ends up in releasing carbon dioxide. You'll have to talk to a marine chemist to get the specifics. Um, but it, I don't know, it, it's interesting and complicated to include those in, in those calculations, which I think is important. Um, but even, even though there is some generation of carbon dioxide and, and carbonate formation in those shells, um, there are other benefits that shellfish have on, on carbon production in that um, the, the co-occurrence of marine shellfish and seaweeds or, or eelgrass really improves their photosynthetic capacity. So it's a complicated question and it's hard to include in, in analyses, but it's, it is something that's um, important to include in some, in some measure. And we're still thinking about how, how to include it in those estimates. Certainly, uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing some of your work in that direction because it's always been curious that it gets omitted from a lot of the discussions and they're very plant-based. Other questions from the board? Steve? Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, and uh, thank you, Joanna, for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, and I, I'm trying to, um, this is maybe a little bit of a question and a little bit of a comment too, but um, in reading about recent work uh, along the lines of what you're doing to kind of, for lack of a better phrase, put a number on it, you know? Um, and, and so that, and when you can put a number on it, then you can start to do something with it on the policy side, whether it's credits or offsets or figure out how to, um, and, um, and so I guess my question is, is that um, with your work on um, in particular eelgrass and kelp, um, are you aware of, or have you seen other studies that like are getting closer to the putting in, putting a number on it um, type uh, of an answer in terms of tons of carbon sequestered per acre under what conditions and what influences that? And I know that we're not, there yet, but um, I think we're better understanding the dynamics that go into carb into blue carbon. Um, and I'm just uh, so the question there is: are, are you aware of any other studies that are getting us closer to that? Secondarily, does uh, is TNC working um, with the state of Oregon to try and get at um, what sorts of management frameworks we should have around sub submerged aquatic vegetation to best um, take advantage of all of the ecosystem services they provide because, and I think that this is the comment that I'm making is that blue carbon is, is great and wonderful. And I think that figuring out how blue carbon fits in our response to climate change is, a cri is absolutely critical. Um, but I also want to, you know, make sure that we are keeping sight on the, all of the other important ecosystem services with respect to biodiversity, wildlife, um, protecting communities, um, and, and, and all of that stuff. So I think I asked a question that's probably really difficult to answer, and I apologize for that. But I think I was wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for the work that you're doing and, and moving the ball forward on figuring out what role um, management of these near shore ecosystems can play in addressing the climate crisis? Thank you for those questions. Um, so to answer your first question, those initial estimates um, will be covered in the science synthesis. So we're looking at um, those studies who are trying to quantify the contribution. Um, unfortunately, right now, there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of answers. There's a few studies, kind of big picture estimates on a global scale, but really getting into Oregon specific or even Pacific Northwest specific studies is really needed because the mechanics of, you know, ecosystem function here is a lot different than, you know, in the tropics. Um, and then your second um, question, 
I think it's, it is really important to think about blue carbon e ecosystems holistically. So there is absolutely a carbon as a carbon lens to look through, but these, um, these ecosystems and pathways, they have a whole host of other benefits aside from carbon. Um, and the science synthesis will also include a co-benefit assessment um, based on the current literature um, focused on Oregon specifically, again. So we're trying to incorporate both. Thank you very much. And thank you again for the work that you're doing. Great. Any other uh, questions or comments from the board? And I do have one. You asked a question, Joanna, on your last slide of what, how this work can benefit the OOST. And, you know, this is really, I, I believe, a critical kind of first step for all of us working on this in the state to understand blue carbon and the whole landscape here. At the Oost, um, we want to be able to direct funds in the most efficient way to fill data gaps um, and to improve understanding. So I'm really hoping that your work on inventories will show where gaps are in the state in regards to um, some of the mapping that needs to be done. And I'm also hoping that your work will just help us develop um, better methodology. Well, I can't even say better, but just the best methodologies um, around modeling for carbon cycling. And you showed just some very simple graphics there. So there's a lot of, uh, places that that could go, but that's how I'm hoping that your work can help inform us. Um, we have just a few minutes before break, Bob Bailey would like to uh, make a, is it a question, Bob, or um, for, do you have a question for Joanna? No, I was just gonna make a quick statement if I could. Um, and for those of you on the call, I'm with the Alaka Alliance. We're interested in bringing sea otters back to the Oregon coast. And they've been characterized in the media as little climate warriors because of their blue carbon impacts. And we've, uh, Joanna, I just want to commend you for your work of get, trying to get your arms around this topic because the closer we've looked at it, the less that there's, we see, uh, just for the very factors that you said, particularly on, on kelp and uh, the contribution of kelp to blue carbon storage, et cetera. So this, we've chased uh, a number of key kelp scientists uh, around the world, had meetings with them. Uh, and that's just, it's, we really can't answer the kinds of questions that I think people are expecting about blue carbon just yet. So I think your, your assessment here is, is really valuable, at least framing uh, this important topic and pointing out the research areas that are needed uh, as we go forward. But right now um, it's just, it's, to uh, preliminary to really make some conclusions about the contribution of any one of these sources to the overall carbon budget. That said, this is a hugely important topic and I'm really happy that it's gained the traction it has, but good work. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And, and I agree, it's gonna be imperfect at best as we get started and just even making an attempt to quantify uh, rough estimates of sequestration, it's, it's uh, a big undertaking, but we've got to start somewhere. So thank you to you and to Gina Carter at TNC and Rose Graves also working with you together on this to help bring Oregon kind of hopefully we'll, we'll get some common understanding uh, from your work. We look forward to seeing it and perhaps having another update from you in a future meeting. Um, is there any other uh, questions or comments from the board before we take a break? All right, um, if we can come back at uh, 1.55, um, we will, did I say that right? Is that the right time? Yeah, we'll uh, be a little bit behind, but we'll be queued up to uh, get into the heart of our nearshore RFP concept guidelines approval, so. We'll see you back here in 14 minutes. Thank you.
I am ever so grateful that Lisa is going to be leading us through the next portion of the meeting while I try to regain my video capabilities. So um, with that, Lisa, are you able to take the reins on the Nearshore Science RFP guidelines and concept approval? Yes, I am. Okay, great. I am going to keep trying to get in. Thank you. You bet. Uh, so I'm assuming folks can see my screen. It says Oregon Ocean Science Trust with a wave. Can somebody confirm that? Yes, I can see it. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Appreciate that. So yes, Laura had asked me to walk through the Oregon North Shore, uh, Near Shore Science RFP. I want to kick off this discussion just by emphasizing that this grant process follows the first grant process that the US did last year and really want to thank the folks at Department of State Lands for helping us to shepherd that process and helping us to continue to administer that process uh, as those funds are awarded and as we track prog progress in implementing those grants. Um, and in particular, Michelle Johnson, Jean Strait um, have been super helpful. And Linda, we want to welcome you into the fold and thank you for all of your help, um, as well as the help that Aaron has provided us in the past. And in addition to that, Leanne O'Neill um, helping us with some website uh, issues as well. So a little bit about this process. Last year's process was about ocean acidification and hypoxia. This new grant funding uh, through House Bill 5202 passed by the 2022 Oregon Legislature uh, is a million dollars in funding for science and monitoring on nearshore keystone species. And the legislation mentioned, including sea otters, nearshore marine ecosystems, kelp and eelgrass habitat, and sequestration of blue carbon. So the OOST uh, took that directive from House Bill 5202 and established a goal of developing a suite of projects to be implemented beginning in 2023 that address the highest priority research needs associated with the science and monitoring of nearshore keystone species, et cetera, et cetera, using the language that exactly mirrors House Bill 5202. There's a couple of key documents that we considered um, as Lisa, we started. Lisa, just a second. Can you can you put that into presentation mode so it comes up a little bigger for folks to see? You bet. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know that. Um, there's a couple of key documents that we considered as we started thinking about um, sort of the, the goalposts on this funding. One was to really look back at the 2016 Oregon Ocean Science Summit Report and see what was recommended in that report, but acknowledging that some time has passed since 2016. We also wanted to be grounded in the Oregon Nearshore Strategy, uh, recognizing that that document in that process uh, recommended a suite of nearshore research and monitoring needs. And we wanted to ground, be grounded as well in the territorial sea plan and in specific, the draft Rocky Habitat Management Strategy that is part of that overall larger plan. And in addition to that, we always want, when we think about the, these pieces of legislation and these buckets of funding to always be grounded in the research priorities of OOST itself. And so just as a reminder to everybody, the OOST is focused on research priorities that consider the distribution and abundance of nearshore species and habitats, species and habitat associations and interactions, the effects people have on the nearshore and vice versa, the effects that the nearshore has on people and coastal communities. And lastly, the, effect, the effects of climate change and ocean acidification on species in their habitats. And so always thinking about those key stressors that drive and influence ecological function in nearshore habitats along Oregon's coast. So I, what I wanted to share with you before I share with you that overall draft concept for approval is to talk about process because I want folks to understand how we got to where we are today and what the, um, the board is voting on. So what we did upon receiving House Bill 5202 is we convened a nearshore subcommittee to help us 
think about and make recommendations about what should be included in some of the concepts uh, in this bucket of funding. So we convened a nearshore subcommittee that consisted of Charlie Plybon with Surf Rider Foundation, Dave Fox and Leif Rasmussen of ODFW, Tom Calvinese of Oregon State University, Andy Lanier of the Oregon Department of State Lands, Bob Bailey of the Alaka Alliance, and Aaron Galloway of the University of Oregon. All of these individuals able to provide some level of expertise associated with nearshore research and monitoring. We convened that subcommittee, had a great conversation with them, did some background homework via email with them, and a lot of their recommendations are incorporated in what I'm about to share with you today. But since I've got the timeline slide up, I'll just walk through it right now so that you can see not only where we're at, but the key next steps that we'll be taking to get to February 2023. So today, the goal is to look at that construct, that concept that's been developed to date. Um, and then in between now and the end of August, uh, draft the RFP, similar to what we did in 2022 uh, for the ocean acidification and hypoxia funding. And then during that June, August period as well, we'll be looking at some additional potential fundraising, leveraging of funds, federal funds announcements, et cetera. And then the September through November process is publishing the RFP, verifying it, doing uh, webinars with potential applicants for funding, um, getting the web page up and running in terms of the RFP process itself, getting questions answered by people that uh, have an interest in applying for these funds. And then in December and January, uh, the RFP subcommittee will evaluate, score, and select the projects to be funded. Those projects then are anticipated to be awarded in uh, February of 2023. And we will, of course, work with our great partners at the Department of State Lands uh, to help get those contracts finalized and those funds out the door. Um, so that's the schedule for implementation. I'm going to get out of the slideshow now and pull in the draft research priority, as I will make this bigger, so hang on a second. I go to 200. All right, so you should be able to see this pretty well uh, on your screen now. Um, so these are the, the proposed Oost near shore research RFP guidelines. Lisa, um, I, I don't know about others. I'm still seeing your uh, schedule for implementation slide from PowerPoint. Oh, well, that's a problem. Let me see if I can't uh, get out of this, do a new share. How about that? That is correct. You're Thank there. Thank you. Um, and also, I wanted to mention, too, as part of working with that nearshore subcommittee, in addition to that, and at the initial conclusion of their work, um, Laura did convene a board workshop um, where the board had an opportunity to discuss the recommendations that came from that nearshore subcommittee. And they provided their thoughts and ideas that we then incorporated into what you see in front of you right now. My apologies, Laura, for not mentioning that earlier. So what this looks like now is three main buckets, um, nearshore data collection, nearshore data modeling, analysis and synthesis, and nearshore data management portals and hubs. And the proposal is as follows. In the nearshore data collection category, provide $600,000 for four to six awards ranging from 50 to $200,000 each. And that those awards, we would like to be focused on three basic areas, contributing data on the distribution and abundance of nearshore species and habitat. And we've listed species of interest that could be included in this, but are not limited to these species. They include the ones you see listed there. The second category within nearshore data collection is contributing data to complete the state's inventory and mapping of kelp 
in submerged aquatic vegetation in estuaries in the near shore. And the third is to contribute data on interspecies and species habitat associations. So that's the first category, near shore data collection, 600,000 for four to six awards. The second bucket is near shore data modeling, analysis, and synthesis. And the goal here would be to provide $200,000 for one to three awards ranging from 50 to $200,000 each. And we're looking for projects that develop or contribute to trophic models of Oregon's near shore and or estuarine ecosystems or to develop or contribute to models that improve the understanding of nearshore and estuarine ecosystems relative to carbon cycling, storage, and sequestration potential. In the third bucket is nearshore data management portals and hubs. And this one is a little bit different uh, because it's a phased approach uh, to dispersing this $100,000. So the $100,000 would be for a needs assessment, strategy planning, and pilot project, and full data hub implementation. So what this involves is a first phase of $10,000 through a competitive RFP process in January and February of 2023 to document and inventory existing state and regional ocean data management systems and describe how software can support compiling, archiving, disseminating that information. So the goal is to create a system that can be integrated and coordinated, but first we want a summary of what's out there, uh, how are they talking to one another right now, and how could they better be integrated. Once that first phase is completed, we can do phase two, which is a $40,000 competitive RFP process in March through July of 2023. And it's based on a scoping analysis using the OOST OAH data from 2022 projects to project awards. So in other words, this is a de developmental strategy planning and pilot project. And then phase three is the final $50,000 and there may be additional funding to be sourced as needed. We won't know that until the first two phases are done. And this phase three then would be the full data hub implementation. It would be a competitive RFP offered in July 2023 through 2024. Um, again, it may require additional funds, but the goal would be to develop, test, and implement a fully functioning open source data hub infrastructure to integrate, host, and make publicly accessible Oregon Ocean data sets. What we want to emphasize in this third overall bucket of funding is that nobody wanted to reinvent the wheel and everybody wants a publicly accessible data set, data set where, or portal where all of these places are talking to one another and everybody can access it. So that would be the goal for this third group of funding. And I think at that point, Laura, I'll toss it back to you um, for further comments, uh, anything else you'd like to add in next steps. Thank you, Lisa. I don't really have any further comments on the on what's proposed here. Lisa and I tried to create a balance between enough specificity that the RFP about writing an evaluation committee can do an effective job and yet be somewhat broad enough so that we can embrace the wide range of needs that are seen in the state right now. The way that um, I'd like to proceed today would be to continue to amend this one pager as needed and to adopt it through a motion just by reference. So we'll have a motion to approve these guidelines as uh, stated here by reference um, so that we can move forward. And I will reiterate that after the board has an opportunity to discuss, we will have public comment before we make a final adoption. So there will be opportunity to hear from 
our partners and, and public before we, we solidify this. That's all I have at this point, Misa. So you wanted to open it up, um, Laura, for any additional board comments and input to what they see in front of them here? I think that would be, uh, I think that would be good. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to see, be able to see that as a whole page, Lisa, um, at once, or if that creates too small of a, um, of a viewing window, but I would like to open it up for board discussion at this moment. And if you are on the board and wanting to speak, I'm having some problems with my screen management. Please don't wait to be called on. Feel free to speak. <laughs> I'm trying to get my Hollywood squares aligned here at the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Anderson. This is uh, Steve Marks. <clears throat> just one uh, question I had, and, and I'm just hearkening back to the workshop that we had discussing this um, and just commenting here on the species of interest list. Um, but I, I remember we had a brief discussion about uh, Olympia oysters and whether those might be a species of interest on this list. Um, that could be a that could be a subject for further research because um, I know that there is broad interest across the West Coast for trying to recover populations of of native Olympia oysters. I don't know if 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 that if it's intentional to exclude th those species of interest, and I do note that it says, you know, these include but are not limited to. So um, proposals focused on. Um, or that address in part, at least, uh, native oysters could be included, but I don't know if we wanna call it out here or if, if there's a specific, if, there, if there's a reason why they wouldn't be included in this list. So I don't know if that's an appropriate thing to suggest or whether it's not needed because we're not excluding them explicitly here, uh, but just um, just flagging that as something, uh, I know that there's there's been some interest in and maybe a helpful area of research that we could support. Um, but if there is a reason why, because they're estuarine and not potentially, you know, there's maybe um, ecological or other reasons why that's not included, and that that's fine too. Just bringing it up as something that we did discuss on the work at the workshop. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I'm happy to address that. There were a few um, species that were noted in addition to Olympia oysters. Um, whale interactions had been mentioned and um, I think uh, we'll be hearing in public comment from Audubon um, birds as generally perhaps as a as a category as well. The intention here was to note areas that we heard from the project partners that are of really high priority to the state right now in terms of what would be considered pressing management issues. Um, and I would say that we can add to this list as much as we want. We did want to say not limited to, but the species that were listed here are somewhat of an ecosystem, um, their cohorts of an ecosystem type, if you will, that is probably, at least in my opinion, had been brought to the forefront as being the highest um, priorities for the state. Um, but I'd be interested to hear, uh, to have more discussion on that and to hear from others on their thoughts about this list and whether it's too limiting. And what thank your you. response thank you. That, to that is, Steve, yeah. No, thank you for that, that makes sense. I'd consider it asked and answered, just, just wanted to, to, to flag that. And it's uh, whether we proceed, whether we add to the list or we keep it as is, I'm fine either way. Um, I'd like 
I'd like to chime in uh, regarding uh, agreeing with what Steve is talking about. And, and I don't think there's much, uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of curious that our, our um, the assessment of the reserve, uh, Marine Reserve made a point that there was no estuarine understanding in that uh, particular effort and the importance of estuarine ecology to um, understand a lot of things about climate um, impacts. I, I, I guess I would like to see that put back in there. Um, I think uh, it's, it's pretty important uh, in, in habitat and, and in understanding. So Christine, just so I'm sure I understand, are you asking that we add estuary habitats to this or native oysters? Well, indirectly when you're you're adding eelgrass and and submerged aquatic vegetation, I think that's that's a, a shout out to estuarine habitat. But I think the native oysters is definitely um, in that category and the, and and, uh, and that's the interface of of more of a fresh uh, water with the with the ocean, so I, I think it is all part of nearshore and understanding um, uh, what what what's on the forefront of 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 management issues and um, and sustained ecosystems in in lights of climate change and sea level rise. I had a clarifying question, if I may. Yes, please. Okay, um, we were using the phrase in the um, RFP of submerged aquatic vegetation, and I'm curious to clarify if we're using that in the technical sense that is, you know, commonly used in the among scientists and literature, or whether it includes things like seaweeds, understory seaweeds, which we heard a little bit about uh, in the presentation earlier on blue carbon. Um, and um, just given the call out also in the in the funding award to blue carbon. So just a curiosity there, a clarification. I can't answer that question because I'm not, I don't know what the <laughs> traditional or the scientific ah. uh, range would be. I would say that um, it's typically aquatic plants more than seaweeds, if that helps. Like, so okay. just to give you a sense, estuarine freshwater-ish sort of domain. I would, I, I think that that, I think that SAV, the term, the submerged aquatic, aquatic vegetation would also necessarily include like phyllospatic, so like surf, surf grass. Um, and that was my read of it, but I, I share your uh, desire for clarification, uh, Dr. Nielsen. This kind of does get to something that we did come up with in terms of like geographic scope and how we describe Oregon's territorial sea and estuaries, be it highly technically or in a more general sense. My recommendation to Lisa at this point was to be very general in the Oregon Territorial Sea, including estuaries up to the saltwater edge, and that we allow the RFP writing team to be as detailed as they need to be to make that clear to the, um, to the applicants what that scope is. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that a science applicant would kind of click right away with the SAV definition, and yeah. it would mean something to them that might be different than what's intended, so. How do we feel generally about the, let me ask some kind of pointed questions. We can get back to this list and I think we should review this list even after public comment. There may be some um, partner comments that we wanna consider before we you know, nail this, but 
how do we feel generally about the three um, buckets approach and the and the distribution of funds and number of awards in each? Yes, Steve. Uh, thank you. Um, I, um, I'm in trying to figure out how to, to frame my comment here. It's uh, with res it's relative to the second uh, category, the nearshore data modeling analysis and thin synthesis. And we've got two focal areas here. One is trophic models, which are food web models. Um, and they are based on where organisms exist in a tr uh, what trophic level and what's eating what. Um, and then we've got a second category around models relative to blue carbon. So we're we're so this so this section would would go to support research into food web modeling um, and uh, blue carbon. Um, but there are other sorts of nearshore modeling I think that also are important um, it, it, that get at the ecosystem services provided by these habitats, including things around sea level rise, uh, sedimentation. Um, what, you know, like a mechanistic understanding of how these nearshore ecosystems provide some of the, the services and benefits that, that we as communities and, and that the broader ecosystem um, derive from these habitats. So I don't know if our intent is to keep this section focused solely on food web modeling and blue carbon modeling or if there's other types of mechanistic ecosystem modeling efforts that could be informative to what we're trying to do here. And so that's not a, I think that either way, again, I'm, I'm a little like if, if, it, if, the, if the intent here is to focus on just those two subsets of modeling efforts, that's fine too. But I just wanted to note that as written, these, these projects would be limited to just, just the trophic modeling and just the blue carbon modeling and me. Um, unintentionally, or if it's intentional, that's fine too. exclude other types of modeling efforts that may be informative. Um, I don't know if other folks have the same read on that as I do. Um, if not that if, 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 if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be wrong and, and, and on that too, but just wanted to kind of uh, share my read of, of those two items underneath the, the modeling category. Thank you, Steve. Um, I guess my my response to that would be those didn't come up in the um, project subcommittee per se, not to my recollection. And I think also we were um, attempting to narrow the focus to that which was stated in House Bill 5202. So 5202 specifically calls out science and monitoring on species. Um, it, uh, ecosystems is a very general term um, with kelp and eelgrass habitat and sequestration of blue carbon. So that may be why we didn't go into the um, physical, geophysical or biophysical kinds of modeling that you just called out. If you're okay with keeping the focus on the trophic and blue carbon as it relates to 5202. Um, I do think that we could look at other funding opportunities to um, approach the geophysical and biophysical elements that you're talking about. That, thank you, Chair Anderson, that, that's, that's fine to me. Yeah, it, it, Keeping it to the spirit of the legislation is appropriate. I just wanted to flag that. Thanks. Let's see. Um, so uh, any any additional thoughts on this phased approach to nearshore data management? Again, this phased approach was a recognition that 
we need to take this in a stepwise fashion and to go all out with, uh, you know, and expect to get what we need is um, probably premature. There had been um, discussion of doing either a single source contract for that first phase one needs assessment because it is a small amount, but in the interest of kind of the oosts is, is set up to run competitive RFPs. Um, I'm recommending here that we, even though this is a small, um, a small phase one needs assessment and uh, we do have capacity in state to do it, that we go ahead and, and put it out competitively. Um, are there any thoughts or comments on this strategy for data management? I was just going to comment <clears throat> that I think it's it's great to have a stepwise progression and it helps keep us focused on where you want to go. So I, I think it's great. Um, and I just hope that the 10K is adequate for somebody to to uh, get in there and do that. That That's the only thing that I worry about. But um, I guess that can uh, can be determined by figuring out who's out there to to do that. Yeah, I agree. It does seem like a very small amount, but that was verified with um, some of our project partners at Acoin that are interested in this work, um, that this could be, this kind of needs assessment could be put together for that amount. So it was verified. Um, any other um, overarching thoughts about this? Um, I, I think we could open up for public comment a little earlier than the 240 time slot, as long as we have it available at the 240 time slot. I would like the opportunity to revisit our discussion after we've heard from some of our um, potential applicants, project partners, members of the public. So. Um, anything before we go into public comment and um, come back to discussion? Okay, Lisa, if you want to stop the screen share, we can come back and I'll open up my chat window. And if you could put uh, your name into the chat, I will call on you in order for comments um, on this or anything um, OOST related. Okay, we'll start with uh, Joe Lubazite with Audubon. Uh, thanks, Chair uh, Anderson and uh, OOST members. My name for the record is Joe Lubazite, Portland Audubon staff scientist. And um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to comment on the, this RFP process and prioritization of projects. And I just want to start out by first saying I agree with, um, with what's on there right now, on the docket right now. Um, but one thing that I see missing that um, has, has been an issue that um, has been raised again and again, mostly through the Territorial Sea Plan 3 process, which I know is one of the um, ground documents for this RFP that folks are using to kind of help decide what projects to prioritize. That's the Rocky Habitat Management Strategy. Is um, if, if folk, and I know a lot of the folks in this call were heavily engaged on that process. And um, But for those of you who weren't, um, as part of the update to the TSP3 Rocky Habitat Strategy, the public provided, um, the public was invited to submit proposals. And so I think there are 12 or something proposals submitted from across the coast, different groups. And one reoccurring theme that um, uh, that uh, was presented during that was the need to better research, track, and monitor wildlife disturbance issues, particularly wildlife human disturbance interactions and issues. And, um, 
And as we know, human population has increased um, and visitation on the coast has increased, particularly during the, the summer visits. And, you know, we want to we want to balance the that increasing human t visitation with you know protecting those resources that people actually come to visit. And so I guess that's what this boils down to really is um, it's not a particular species, like I could say birds, I'm Audubon, but it's really about the um, the uh, those that interaction between people and, and um, the wildlife impacted. And most it's mostly you know nesting birds during the summer season um, and pupping marine mammals and so forth. And I can't tell you a day doesn't go by this time of year. Uh, we we uh, monitor oyster, black oyster catchers up and down the coast where I don't get a call or an email saying I just had a drone you know, disturbing this bird for a nest, or I just had people walking up to a, um, a pup sea lion uh, that died. And so um, I feel like there needs to be a priority for research for um, quantifying um, that issue. And it doesn't have to be, it, it, I mean, there's specifically, there are some bird species that are near shore strategy species of black oyster catchers there's uh, marine mammals that are nutrient strategy species. So it does fit totally within your RFP. Um, and it is a high priority state issue. I, I think it, and you know, I think the Rocky Habitat uh, Working Group, many of those folks who are on this call now would agree. I think they identify that as a reoccurring theme uh, during that process. And it is, it is a pressing management issue. So I would just recommend including that. Um, that there needs to be a research focus uh, or that folks that apply for this pot of money and for a project, there should be a priority prioritization on um, looking at and learning more about wildlife disturbance on our, on our coast to inform management moving forward. And I think that this will help um, facilitate the successful implementation of that new updated Rocky Habitat Management Strategy I mean, there's folks in this call that worked on this thing for literally like five years and now we're at the cusp, it's been finally adopted. There are some sites that have been nominated and we don't, we wanna move forward with that effort into the long-term and inform how we can best manage our rocky habitats for people and for wildlife. And I think this RFP process is a great opportunity for that. So I just highly recommend you guys include that um, in there. Um, so I think it would probably fit most in the first part um, where you have those species identified. I know you didn't put up, call out birds there and they, they could be included in there, but I would just, instead of saying birds so much or identifying species, I would just say wildlife, human disturbance, interaction research. So I guess that's my recommendation. Thanks so much uh, for your time and I'll yield now. Thank you, Joe. Um, one of the things that's, not on this kind of simplified guidelines is the scoring criteria. And I do know that that is where some of the um, human dimension um, components were going to also be parked. So um, in addition to uh, being able to put them up front, also being able to score applicants based on um, addressing some of the human dimension concerns like you just mentioned. Um, Charlie Plyben. Hey, thanks, <clears throat> uh, Chair. For the record, my name is Charlie Plyben. I'm the Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. I live in South Beach uh, on the Central Oregon Coast. I just wanna thank everybody. Um, this is really hard work. It's complicated work and it represents the first time the state of Oregon is really made a big key investment other than the marine reserve program uh, in science in our near shore. And so this is, this is a big deal. It's a big step for Oregon. Um, and and I, I just want to congratulate uh, the work and the thoughtfulness that's going into how this money is being allocated. Um, I think particularly for our coastal legislators, I think that they like to see how um, money like this is very thoughtfully thought through and you bring a lot of great people together and stakeholders um, around making these decisions. So I just want to thank everybody for your great work here. I think I'm, I'm really excited as, as somebody who's sat um, on the sidelines and watched investments go to our forests and go to a lot of other terrestrial interests. Um, I'm really excited to see this uh, investment in the near shore. It could not be more timely 
with some of the things that I think uh, we're concerned about on the Oregon coast and stakeholders are, are concerned about uh, with respect to existing uses um, and new potential uses. And so this inventory work, the investments in our science and our near shore and our management, I think is, is critical. And I just, I'll lastly just say, you know, I think Will White did an amazing job um, taking what was supposed to be really questions that are academically impossible to get at. Um, they're political questions, a lot of them. Uh, and, and did a great academic exercise with that, that work. Um, I think there's some stuff to build off of there for, for both our, you know, considering the future legislation. Um, and also just like maybe giving Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife the opportunity to present their synthesis report, I think would be great. I'd love to hear their reactions to this. Today might have been the first time they heard it too. I don't know, um, given they were not uh, supposed to be involved in that. So I think something that OOS could do is facilitate that dialogue. Um, that might be helpful for stakeholders, uh, particularly uh, legislative audiences that might be trying to think about um, how to act on, on some of those things. So thanks so much. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, we'll have to schedule an all day meeting probably to get a real overview on the synthesis report, but I would like to see it as well, especially in as much as it can help us continue to inform where our data gaps are in the state so that the OOS can go out and get those funds, bring it in and start filling those gaps. Thank you. Um, other public comment, I don't have anybody else uh, signed up, but there's a lot of project partners um, on the call. So don't be shy if you do have, um, even if it's just a thumbs up, um, That would be fine. I see a thumbs up from Bob Bailey, except for his thumb is kind of flipping in and out with the green screen. Uh, that's good. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your championing of this entire movement and, uh, and looking forward to, to bringing this funding to fruition. All right. Well, as I suspected, we were going to catch up with our uh, timing today. So that said, um, I think we can uh, close public comment and resume our board discussion. Um, what I believe I saw, Lisa, before we went to public comment was the near shore guidelines with um, a couple of amendments and notes. Do you wanna pop that back up? And if, um, I'm going to put a couple of draft motions into the chat for um, the board's consideration. I'm doing this in part also to kind of help our note taker. Sometimes I make a rambling motion and somebody will say so moved and then it's very hard to capture what the actual motion was. So I'm gonna to try to do a better job of supporting our note taker. Um, what I would like to be able to do is um, move to approve the RFP guidelines by reference um, rather than read this whole sheet and move to approve to assemble a RFP committee that can publish RFPs in this, and I say spirit of these approved guidelines. And I think that the idea for us here today is to have a good general sense. Um, I want to make sure we have enough clarity on SAV, marine aquatic vegetation, and particularly this species list, but I also want to give latitude to the RFP committee to dig in to getting the, the actual word smithing of that um, done. So, um, do we have further clarifications that we can make here that will help the RFP subcommittee do their job? Thank you, Chair Anderson. One, one quick question, um, and I, and 
I'm thinking back to, to Joe Liebesite's comment and your response uh, to him. And I just wanna make sure that that, if it's not captured here in the RFP guidelines, that it is that we do have a chance to ensure that the scoring matrix appropriately uh, allows for um, inclusion of research that addressed ad address the issue that Joe raised about human um, wildlife interactions and where there may be adverse impacts and, and things like that. So I, I if, if I heard your response to Joe correctly, uh, and let me know if I'm wrong, was that, is that that is something that we can address through the scoring matrix um, and may not need to be included in the, the guidelines themselves. That's a great uh, point and question. Um, Lisa, you've become very familiar with the architecture of plugging in the, um, the bones of this. Does that um, seem, did, was what I described uh, consistent with um, where, you, where your notes are on that? Yes, in fact, I was thinking the very same thing as Joe was talking because we already have a draft list of criteria based on our discussion with the Nearshore RFP subcommittee and the board workshop. We've got a draft list of criteria and that would go great in that list to have that be considered. Lisa, do you think we should include that? Um... Right now, can we amend this to include the criteria as we're going to be adopting this by reference? Um, is that something that you can grab from your other documents easily or? Yes. So are you wanting me just be sure I understand or do you want me to show the that document in its entirety, the one I sent you? No, I'm thinking of just grabbing those bullet or maybe we can just note on here. I, I just know that we did have, I had, Lisa had sent me a, a pretty dense three page document that I tried to make into a pretty simple one page document for approval. So I might have been a little bit too um, aggressive in removing um, some of the, uh, some of the, context there. Yeah, I, um, since, since we didn't share that draft criteria yet uh, in advance of this meeting, I wonder if that's something that just could be directed to the RFP subcommittee to address and ensure is incorporated. Okay. And let's make, and, uh, and we'll just be sure that we do have that um, human dimension. Um, there were several criteria surrounding um, human interaction with the near shore. Um, some of that came from, I recall specifically, Charlie Plyben's uh, contributions right. to the subcommittee work. Um, and some of that was documented in previous meetings. So we'll make sure that's... That's there. And Laura, I think the location of that was in those draft meeting minute summaries that I sent to you. Okay. Here, and I've got it right here if you wanna just look at that list. Um, I can pop it up it, just real quickly. The criteria that was discussed by the board at that workshop was, it built on the 2022 RFP, so leveraging partnerships, integrating local expertise, filling data gaps, filling temporal gaps, mandating a communication strategy that was important to board members, having a management nexus, um, making sure the questions are framed uh, for future outcomes, um, making sure that the topics people are recommending that be researched are ones that were actually described in the legislation. So aligning those priorities with legislative interests, projects that can leverage funding, um, making sure data is accessible and usable, and making sure there's a public engagement component. And so we could then add Joe's comments here to this draft list for further build out by the RFP subcommittee to include that additional human dimensions, wildlife disturbance component. Yeah, projects that address human wildlife interactions 
and we can we can pull we I think the RFP subcommittee can pull more detail into that referencing back to some of Charlie Cliven's comments about um, human uh, uses of the near shore and uh, impacts to the near shore. And estuaries as we define the geographic scope. Yeah, that's great. I um, okay. Any other need for clarification? Any heartburn? Any last minute burning desires here? <laughs> When the board feels so moved to make a motion, I would entertain Steve. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I'll go ahead. Uh, I move to approve the Oregon Ocean Science Trust Nearshore RFP guidelines dated July 6, 2022 by reference. You're the only one, Christine, you gotta. <laughs> <laughs> the seconder. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I was I was losing my mute button here. Um, I would second that motion that Steve made. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right, we'll pass that unanimously. And um, I think uh, I, I never know what we need a motion for, but I'm always surprised to find that we didn't make a motion when we had to. So forgive me if I'm being a little too diligent, but I would like the motion to authorize the committee. Christine, would you be willing to make that motion? I wrote it into the chat uh, for reference. Sure, Th and thank you for doing that. So that uh, I would move to authorize the chair to assemble the RFP committee and publish the RFPs in the spirit of the approved guidelines. Second. Thank you. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And one more um, that we talked about in our previous, you'll note that all of those uh, projects add up to 900,000. I'd like um, and a motion for the retention of a 10% administration so that we can actually run this process. Thank you, I'll, I'll go ahead. I move to retain 10% of the House Bill 5202 allocation for project administration. Second, the motion. All right, all in favor? Hi. Hi. Hey, fantastic. That concludes our need to make motions regarding this moving forward. I think at our next meeting in October, we will already have the RFPs out there and floating. Lisa, can you tell us who you've already lined up for um, the RFP team? Yes, uh, so Christine Moffitt has agreed to serve uh, as a board member on the review committee uh, or the RFP team, as well as Selena Hapel at Oregon State University. Um, I've got a couple of other requests floating out there. Um, one is, uh, oh boy, it's been a long day today. Zach. Uh, Randall. Randall from Oregon State University, who's now doing some work on kelp up in Seattle. Um, as well as uh, I did ask Christina Wolniakowski, she however declined because of her, her work with the Gorge Commission um, during those months. And we did ask Karina, um, she's got a lot on her plate right now, so I'm not sure she, we're gonna give her a little bit more time to think about it. The one thing we are doing differently this time is we're not gonna try and write by committee. Um, 
staff is going to try to do a lot of the background work and do as much of the writing as possible and then give it to the RFP committee to literally review and you know, add some of that additional scientific expertise. So we're trying to make it a really efficient process for those people that decide to, to do this with us. But that's what we've got going right now. Sounds great. All right, well, wrap a bow up on that one. And I would, um, I'd hope to have a little bit more time. I do want to end on time, um, but Lisa, are you able to give us a spin around the um, website proposal yes. today or are we a little too pressed for that? No, I think we can do it in just a couple of minutes. Great, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so you should see the existing website right now. Um, we actually built this website just for the 2021 request for proposals, as all of you recall. Um, DSL maintains uh, some elements of an, of an OOST website framework on their website. Um, but as we started building this website out, we started to think it needed to be more than just information about the RFP. So we started talking about the trust. And before we got to it, we were building out sections with press releases and everything else. So working closely with DSL, and Leanne O'Neill has been working on a bunch of the web work for them. We worked with her to suggest the development of this new website. Um, it's a draft. Um, if it were to go live, you wouldn't see this stuff up at the top, like upgrade now. It would just morph immediately to OregonOceanScience.com. But it's a way to talk more about the trust and what it does. Lisa, I think uh, we're seeing something that's not what you want us to see. Well, that a, interesting. Um, you share. Still seeing the news of the uh, RFP. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So this, thank you. So with Zoom, it's, it's very difficult to see what all of you are seeing compared to other video platforms. So thanks for letting me know that. So yeah, this is the, the proposed framework for a new website. Talks a lot about the work of the organization, its funding priorities, maybe some major tenets of belief. Um, there's a lot more about who the trust is and that it was established by the legislature and what its core duties are. Um, more information about the trust members and some mug shots. Um, a comprehensive place where people can go to get all the information about the meetings, both uh, present and future. Um, resources and links for documents and nearshore research. We've got an FAQ page and the funded research. So this is where we would put all the grants that have been awarded and projects that have been funded. So there's been work done on marine reserves. We've got a page for that. And this is the major ocean acidification and hypoxia. Uh, all of the research projects that have been funded, you can click on these, scroll down, get more information about each one of them. Um, and then when we announce new grants opportunities, uh, like the grant that we'll be announcing this fall, this will be the place where they can go to. It'll have a big drop down menu with everything that the old website has. We still have a new section. Um, and of course they can contact us. And right now we do, we do have the donate now button at the top of that page, which takes you to the Oregon Community Foundation's online system. So it's a, it's a proposal for a new look that kind of breathes some life into the Oregon Ocean Science Trust and kind of share more about its overall scope. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what kind of a formal or informal process we need before we go live with this, but I would like the opportunity for the board to be able to take it for a spin and uh, maybe some uh, project partners as well before we, we launch it. Um, but uh, thank you for that update. Any initial feedback or um, any impressions that you want to give to Lisa at this time? Yeah, 
Thank you, Chair Anderson. This is Steve Marks. Just, I would just say uh, thank you to Lisa and to the folks at DSL for working to pull this together. I, I think it looks great. Um, and it's kind of, you know, one-stop shopping for what folks are, you know, people who are engaged in, in this um, <clears throat> for, and provides a place where they can get information, which I think in, in the past has been different websites. Um, so I, it looks great to me and thank you for your work. And um, I'm not sure what, uh, as Chair Anderson said, I'm not sure what, what is needed from the OOS side of things, but just wanna express my appreciation. Yeah, I'll continue to work with Lisa on this. A couple of things that I want to be that I'm really monitoring is making sure that the OOST retains its neutrality on policy and that we are only talking about the science that we are doing and or supporting. Um, there's a lot of information that we could build in. There's a lot of links that we could build in. There's a lot of partnerships we could build in, but I'm not really inclined to be a clearinghouse of information to describe blue carbon or describe um, what all these different things are. There's lots of resources out there, but it's really a place for us to talk about the science that we're supporting. Um, so I think that it's, a really good window into that. All right. Um, are there any other member updates or other business to get on into today's meeting and our final moments here? I'd like to do one thing is share a screen of some beautiful artwork that is relevant. I am um, very busy right now with our Oregon Coast Music Festival, and I had to share this rendition by uh, Susan Chambers of some amazing rockfish on the reef and uh, her rendition. So I had to share that with you today. Um, our festival starts in about a week. So thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Any other updates or any other business? All right, well, we'll start putting together our agenda for three months from now. The RFP committee has some work to do and uh, we got it all in. Nice work, people. <laughs> very, very well done. And uh, at 2.59, I am adjourning this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.